Hey folks, this is Alan Jones at Hi-Fi Buys. I'm in our Legends room, and I have David White joining me here today. Say hi, David. Hi, this is David White from Hi-Fi Buys. Being in our Legends room, it's very appropriate. We want to tell you a little bit about a legendary brand and a legendary dude by the name of Richard Vanderstein. Richard is one of those special guys that just, uh, in the 70s, he had very firm beliefs, and those beliefs are basically physics, and they involve time and phase coherence. He is the only man manufacturer in the world that from the bottom of his line to the top of his line, they are all time and phase coherent designs. So David, tell folks a little bit about what is time and phase? One's kind of tied to the other and how can they be separated? Because there are manufacturers out there that talk about their time domain yeah. and that kind of thing. So if you don't mind, help us a little bit with that. We have some examples here of some Vanderstein speakers and they show a slope back as they go from the bottom to the top, and that is what causes time alignment because high frequencies coming out of the drivers at the top are going to arrive at your ears sooner than lower bass frequencies here in this lower bass region. And so they are positioned that way so that when they meet at your ears, the timing arrival will be the same. Why is that important? Well, it makes a drum sound like it's not disjointed and coming at you from like three different drivers. And a lot of manufacturers will have one driver going one way and one going the other. In other words, they'll literally put the positive and the negative. The wire the mid the mid range out of phase. The mid range out of phase. Yeah, and you can so, see that through an impulse diagram because mm -hmm. it will go down and then come back up. What it means is that when an impulse hits those three speakers, in the case of a, a tweeter, a mid range, and a bass driver, we would like them all to start their excursion all at once mm -hmm. and all of them move like that but when the mid-range is wired out of phase it's moving backwards while the tweeter and the bass are moving forward. So the one thing we've learned in this is that uh, a first order network which is 6 dB per octave that's the amount of, of decay of the sound as like the tweeter is dropping off as the mid-range is picking up to it. There's yep. 6 dB per octave mid-range up to the tweeter and 6 dB per octave tweeter down to the mid-range. What that means is that the, the tweeter is operating in a much larger frequency realm. Bandwidth, they call it. Yep. Yeah, bandwidth. The mid-range is operating in a much larger bandwidth in a first order time and phase coherent design. When you go to a second, third, or fourth order, there is no way for it to be time and phase coherent at that point because the crossovers themselves shift that phase. And so you end up finding it kind of uh, slants the timing over the different frequencies as they come out of the crossover. To expound on what Alan's saying, basically those steeper crossovers, it takes longer for the signal to trans translate through them. Okay. So one driver is moving ahead of the other one because the signal is propagating to it as it goes through a steeper filter. Okay. There's more components for it to go through. And so you can have uh, speakers that are time aligned, sloped back like we talked about here, but they have steeper slope crossovers and therefore their drivers are not moving at the same time. So we have time alignment that gets screwed up by phase incoherence. Okay. And there are speaker companies that make speakers like that. They seem to be time aligned in the way they're designed, but they don't use crossovers that are six decibel per octave that maintain that phase coherence. Correct. So, so it's all about timing arrival of stuff getting to your ear. You know, you're either gonna you're either gonna screw it up by having the, the drivers all on one plane and they get to your ears at the wrong time, or you're gonna put them on a on a raked back plane but have the crossover cause them to arrive at your ears at the wrong time. So even if you had the ability to kind of move them individually and do that kind of stuff, you still can't be phase correct. You nope. can be kind of time correct. Yeah, they try to be time correct. <laughs> if they could measure speakers for their time domain performance, most of them would be thrown out because they're, they're so incorrect. Mm -hmm. If amplifiers did as much to the time domain as speakers do, we'd say the amplifiers were broken. Right. And that's something I, I think I'm quoting from Richard. He has said that before many a time. Yep. There's really no types of measurements for that in the types of measurements that most reviewers do. Right. Um, and, and some people are more, more susceptible to it than others. And it bothers them. They can't listen to the speakers very long and they get fatigued because of the anxiety it creates in their, yep. in their brain. It also creates a, kind of the people that get it kind of creates the most loyal customer you could possibly have. Yeah. Um, because kind of once you've been around a Vanderstein speaker, I couldn't tell you how many people upgrade from one to the next. One of the things you don't see is an awful lot of used Vandersteins out there. You probably see some twos because they've sold, I don't know, 100,000 
pairs plus. Uh, Way, plus. Yeah. So there is a really great uh, review that is out in the Absolute Sound. I believe it was in uh, May's issue, I believe, and it's on the seven extremes. And it really breaks that down to a very nice degree and helps you really understand kind of what is really in the value of a, of a Bannerstein seven extreme. Speaking of the, the, the seven extreme that we have over here on this side of me, there's three speakers that Vanderstein makes that have what he calls like a, a powered sub bass system in them. Mm -hmm. It's the Vanderstein Quattro Wood CT, which I have a pair of, and then there's the Kento, and there is the Model 7 Extreme. And mm -hmm. Alan has a pair of the Model 7s before it became the Model 7 Extreme. Yep. So we're, we're big time Vanderstein owners and understand what the, what the beauty of them is, both physically as well as to your ears. There is an 11 band equalizer in these speakers, the top three we just talked about, mm -hmm. for their bass subsystem. In each speaker, it starts at a different point, but basically you're starting at a frequency, in the case of the Quattro, is 100 hertz. The subsystem's taking over the bass at that point. Mm -hmm. So you use a thing called a high pass filter that starts rolling bass out of the main amplifiers at the same frequency that the subwoofer's amplifier is gonna pick up the bass. Mm -hmm. So you get a perfect transition in terms of the point where they, one rolls out the bass and the other one rolls in the bass. And you also get a perfect transition in that they both use six decibel slopes. Mm -hmm. So the slope of one rolling out is matched by the slope of one rolling in. And so that's the perfect way to implement a crossover in a subwoofer. And he's done it within his technology. So what we're doing is taking the signal from the preamp. Mm -hmm. It's going into a high pass crossover. Yep which is basically from about 100 hertz and up, allowing the signal to come through. Correct. So in a lot of powered systems, you're sending an amplifier out and you're giving it the whole 20 to 20 thing, and you're really wasting a lot of power. So when we do kind of get to a point that we're releasing all this bass from the amplifier having to produce it because we know the speaker will, then we actually have an amplifier that can do its job so much easier because we've kind of taken the heavy lifting off of it. That's absolutely correct. That's the beauty of these high pass filters that he uses and you put in front of a typical amplifier when you're using it with one of his speakers that has a sub bass system. It relieves the work of that amplifier from having to do the work that the sub bass system is already going to do anyway. There's a mathematical formula that you can calculate when we ask an amplifier to produce three decibels more of volume that we have it double its power. That's a law of physics. So every time we bump its volume up 3 dB, we have to double its power again. The beautiful thing about these high pass filters is they are a six decibel filter and it starts rolling down the bass six decibels per octave at 100 hertz in the case of the Quattro. Right. So that means 100 hertz to 50 hertz, which is the next octave, it goes down 6 dB. At 50 hertz, it's down 6 dB. Down 25 hertz, which is the next octave, it's down 12 dB. So we've just asked that amplifier to do 12 dB less work at 25 hertz. Which is its hardest That's the hardest thing, thing for it to do. And we've just, that's 3 dB times 3 dB times 3 dB times 3 dB. And that's 1 half times 1 half times 1 half times 1 half. We get 1 16th wow. of the amount of power from that amplifier when we ask it to produce a 25 hertz note. So it's sitting there going, wow, now I, when I get a 25 hertz note coming through me, I only have to produce 1 16th the amount of power I used to. That's correct. And where are we getting that 25 hertz note from? We're getting it from the subwoofer amp. Right. We've just relieved that main amplifier of its hardest work and it just thanks us and makes it sound so beautiful on the top part of the speaker. That's the beauty of the way Richard does these things. It's just genius. It allows us to, for example, in this case, use a tube amplifier in a case where maybe we wouldn't have been able to if we had to drive this whole large cabinet full of speakers. And so we do a lot of mating of tube amplifiers, for example, with Richard's, yep, Richard's absolutely. gear. But the other thing you can do in terms of amplifiers is what we have as an example over here on the left, and that is that Richard decided he knows how to make amplifiers because he does a really good job of ones that are inside of his sub-bass systems. Mm -hmm. And he Also been a dream of his. He, he decided <laughs> he, he, he knew what to do to make the perfect complementary amp to his sub-bass system 
speakers. So he's got an amplifier that sounds as sweet as it can be on the top part of any of his speakers because it's going to perfectly complement and mate up with the sub bass system in these speakers and not have circuitry it doesn't need. Right. To drive a great big passive bass speaker because it's never going to be hooked up to try to do that. These amplifiers have been uh, so well received out there. We have uh, had so many comments from so many people about the quality of sound that comes from it and just how it's just kind of an effort. I've never heard their quattros sound so good. Yes. Several people have said. I bought a pair of them for my quattros. Yep. Richard did that thing where we do to customers. He loaned me a pair. (laughs) Try out my home and it was like, okay, now I have to buy a pair. Everybody talks about, well, why can't somebody kind of design a system? Well, guys, here you are. You've got a gentleman that knows exactly what he's doing, building a speaker with an adjustable bass system and also amplifiers to take care of the rest. There's really not a lot of play there. He's also just come so, out with a pre-amplifier. Mm-hmm. It's got so a you, you can actually get an all the Vanderstein system. You just have to find a source to plug in your preamp. Correct. But Which you can we, have we can help you with. Yeah, you can have an all the <laughs> Vanderstein system. And he brought the prototype of his preamp here uh, last end of last year, and yep. it sounded fantastic. We played it on the Kentos with his M5 HBAs, and it was an all the Vanderstein system that just was mind blowing. Let's talk about the room adjustability of the bass. There's on the back of each <coughs> one of his bass system speakers, he's got an 11 band equalizer. It's kind of just hidden away with 11 little potentiometers that you can't see unless you get down there with a flashlight. And so you have from, in the case of the Quattro, from 100 hertz down to 20 hertz, you've got an 11 band equalizer, mm-hmm. which, which if you think about that for a second, this is crazy. You got 11 band equalizer and, from- we're, and we're talking about two and a half octaves. Mm-hmm. So it's super fine tuning your bass response to match what the room is doing to it. Because yep. let's face it, the room tries to screw up your bass response. Every room has a bass problem. And every time we've gone in with a pair of these speakers, and I, I used to do all the tuning, you'd always find at least three spots in those 11 bands where you had too much bass and at least three spots where you had too little. Mm-hmm. So out of 11 bands, half of them were wrong. So you can adjust and this is all in the analog domain. We're not playing magic with digital signal processing because you don't want to screw up a turntable and turn it into a digital device. What you're actually doing is adjusting the, the linearity of the amplifier, you, correct? You are doing like you used to have with an equalizer. You're doing it all in the analog domain. But an EQ in that time would actually adjust phase and stuff. This is having no effect no. on the phase. And, and you can't go crazy. Mm-hmm. It, it, it allows you to adjust upward 3 dB and downward 5 dB. Mm-hmm. But the way we tune it, we can usually then take these these hot spots and these low spots and get them all within plus or minus 3 dB in your room. I will even tell you all a story and I'll share one on David here. <laughs> David was looking at a bunch of different speakers and was talking to me, and this was, I don't know, probably 10 years ago or so. 2015, yeah. So we were looking at a bunch of different speakers and trying to kind of figure out what he wanted to do. And so I was trying to get him involved in going out and setting up some of the different Vandersteins so he could hear what the effect is of, of having that. And after you went out on a few of those visits and setups, right. I remember your response to me. Do you remember it? Yeah, you, if you see what you would be living with if you can't do this, you can't live with it. Right. <laughs> I mean, you know, once you see your room response, you go like, I just soon I wish I'd never seen that. Yes. If I can't correct it, I just soon not ever see it. But correct. the fact that you can correct these is what's so magical about them. So I've had my pair for like nine years now. Yep. And that's the longest I've ever owned a pair of speakers. I got mine in 2016. Shall we say I'm as happy as I can be and they get used often. And your speakers before that, were time and phase correct they were metal arc audio yeah. blue heron twos so yep. i think there's a theme to what alan likes here yes yes i am one of those that get gets the time and phase thing i'm sensitive to it i have a hard time identifying exactly what it is but every time i go back to a vanderstein it always feels like home we've got another high-end pair of speakers here called rockport technologies i don't mind saying both of these guys have a different way that they're doing things this is the only of those time and phase coherent products but there's also a lot of other things that Rockport's doing in their own world, but one thing that's kind of comparable between both of them, and I wanted to mention this, is that Richard has a lot of respect for Rockport, and Rockport has a lot of respect for Richard. Both the companies use a a technology that allows them to meet a, a goal of physics, which in a driver is to have maximum lightness, maximum stiffness, but have dampening. Mm-hmm. And so both of them use a type of carbon fiber mm-hmm. in a sandwich construction where carbon fiber is on the outside. Both sides. Of both sides. And then on the inside is a dampening material. The carbon fiber provides the maximum lightness and maximum stiffness. The dampening material is what provides the dampening. And in Richard's case, he uses a specific density 
of balsa wood. Right, pounds per square inch. That's a certain specific density he looks for that becomes a dampening agent between those two carbon fiber skins. Mm -hmm. And in the case of Rockport, they use spread toe carbon fiber on the outside and the inside of the sandwich, and they use a, a dampening agent called Roacel. Mm -hmm. It looks like a honeycomb material, and they're both doing the same thing. So close that you can tell why they both admire each other. Yes. They're pursuing the same yes. perfect piston technology. So one of the things that we want to talk about in pistonic drivers is that it is impossible without pistonic drivers to have a time or phase coherent speaker. If you have part of the driver going one way and part of the driver going another, it's impossible for it to have its accurate waveform being done in time. It's impossible. What we really like about Vanderstein speakers is they're multidimensional aspects. They are time and phase coherent. And what, again, what's that mean? Time means drivers are aligned so that the slope back and the high frequency drivers are further back than the low frequency drivers. Mm -hmm. Phase coherent means that the crossover doesn't induce a slowdown of the signal from one driver to the next so that they all move at once instead of one moving and then the other one. We love that. It's what causes you to not have brain fatigue or anxiety while you're listening to their music. The other thing we love about him is in, the, in his speakers is the cabinet construction is usually of a quality that's way above other pe competitors at his price point, mm -hmm. especially in his, in his three top speakers, the Quattro, Wood CT, the Kento, and the 7 Extreme. He goes to detail and levels to reduce vibrations, brace the cabinets, make them out of materials that are anti-resonant, and we love that about him. We also love, in the case of the top three models, the ability to use those high-pass filters to help your amplifier get a breath of fresh air, have the heaviest thing lifted from it, and have it work with the speaker's bass amplifier in a way that is just going to make beautiful music together. And then we love the adjustability of the 11-band equalizer in these top three models. There's nothing out there like that. It's an analog equalizer that allows you to make the best of your room and how it's coupled with these speakers and let us tune them for you and get them with to within plus or minus 3 dB and listen to bass like you've never heard it before. I'd say that says it about best for us. Absolutely. One other thing. Richard, we love you, man. <laughs> People talk about, hey, this speaker sounds like this, and this speaker sounds like this, and this speaker sounds like that. Well, then you go and walk into the store, and then whatever you think might sound good, you might ask to hear that. But I'm telling you, make a point to come in here and listen to Vanderstein speakers. You will be rewarded with a sound you may not be aware might be just for you.